walk into any arts and craft shop today, whether a giant retail superstore or small specialist outlet like the one you see here, and you'll soon realise that the ancient art of cross-stitch is alive and well, and what's more, thriving in the 21st century. You can literally create a cross-stitch image of just about anything you can think of, and your finished handiwork can be transformed into decorative everyday items ranging from greetings cards and pictures right through to cushions, table runners and even articles of clothing. Stepping back in time, the first example of stitching would have originated with the cavemen or let's face it, more probably with the cave women, sewing together animal skins to create warm clothing. Practicality was augmented with more decorative stitching quite early on, and examples of cross-stitch from South America, Egypt, Greece and China date back as far as 500 BC. Much early British embroidery and cross-stitch has been preserved in the treasuries of the great churches, and a visit to one of the nation's stately homes will certainly have you spotting plenty of antique cross-stitch to inspire you. Just before we get started, however, it's worth pointing out that not everything that looks like cross-stitch is. Here at Chavenage House, the magnificent room in which Oliver Cromwell is said to have slept in is lavishly hung with tapestries, which modern day cross stitch certainly emulates. Yet the difference between the two is significant. A tapestry is actually woven on a loom, with a carrier chain thread into which the more colourful striking thread is woven. For the rich and powerful of history, tapestry was the ultimate status symbol, and even better was completely portable from palace to grand palace, and the kings and queens of every nation were great patrons of the tapestry maker's art. Now where royalty led, the rest of the population usually followed and as tapestry was far too expensive for the commoners of the land, needlepoint and cross stitch flourished to at least create the effect. In fact, needlepoint and cross stitch today are quite commonly incorrectly termed as tapestry, as they owe their origins to embroidery rather than weaving. Where this is most evident is perhaps history's most famous tapestry of all, the Bayeux Tapestry, which depicts William the Conqueror's invasion of Great Britain. Yes, you've guessed it, the Bayeux Tapestry is technically speaking an embroidery, as it has been stitched, not woven. But as this wonderful historic work of art has been misnamed since at least 1066, it's a bit late to start getting pedantic about it now. Incidentally, if you're wondering what the difference is between needlepoint and cross stitch, it's not a lot, generally speaking, half a stitch. Needlepoint, as you see here, is created with what's termed as tent stitch, the slanting first half of a cross stitch. So now we know who did or didn't do cross stitch in the past, more importantly we need to know who is doing cross stitch for the present and the future. It's no great mystery, because the answer is just about everybody, of all ages and from all walks of life. 
there is very definitely a 21st century revival of the arts and crafts in all forms, whether patchwork, quilting, painting, drawing, decoupage, quilling, card making or paper sculpture, and the list, quite honestly, goes on and on. But more importantly, cross-stitch is no exception to the rule, and people everywhere the whole world over are taking up this enthralling, relaxing and endlessly rewarding hobby. This is a cross stitch, what could be simpler in its most basic form, and this is how you do a whole row of cross stitch, upwards from the bottom left hand corner to top right and then back again from bottom right to top left. Easy, isn't it? and all your top stitches are pointing in the same direction. Here's another stitch called, not terribly originally, back stitch. Take one stitch to the right, come back on the wrong side of the fabric, one stitch to the left and return your thread to whence it came. This gives you a straight line with which you can draw any shape to outline whatever you have cross stitched. These two stitches are all you need to know to get started, so even if you've never so much as stitched on a button in your life before, you'll have it all sewn up, so to speak, in no time at all. However, if you're now asking yourself why you have another 50 minutes of cross stitch programme to watch, just hang fire for a moment. Cross stitching is very straightforward and you don't need to be a top notch embroiderer to produce beautiful work, yet there is more to this art form than might at first meet the eye. Take a look at this magnificent 12 days of Christmas banner, stitched in incredible detail and you can see that to get from our simple cross and back stitches to this, will require something of a journey of discovery. That said, the getting there should always be as rewarding as reaching the destination, and hopefully this introduction to cross stitch will prove the point. As this is an introduction to cross stitch, we'll start at the very beginning, and the best way to get going is with a specially designed kit. Taking a look around this shop, you can see that the choice of cross-stitch kits available is positively mind-blowing. Despite the fact that your fingers might be itching to start stitching, this is the point at which your success, or otherwise, with cross-stitch will be decided. Size is without doubt vitally important, as quite naturally, the larger the piece of cross stitch is, the longer it's going to take you to complete. Cross stitch is time consuming, and for a beginner, seeing progress and actually completing something is extremely motivating. 5 inches by 7 inches is a pretty good maximum size to start with, but much will depend upon the size of the holes in the fabric. If each finished stitch is minute, then even a small piece of cross stitch can take a long time to complete. If you are fairly experienced with a needle from other branches of sewing, then you can skip this next stage. But if this is your first ever attempt at anything remotely connected to needlecraft, take a look at this kit made by Anchor, which has been designed especially with younger cross stitchers in mind. 
With any product, children are always the most demanding of consumers and instructions must be straightforward and easy to follow. This excellent kit certainly ticks rather than crosses all the boxes and offers an ideal opportunity to show you what you get in a cross-stitch kit and perhaps more importantly, what you need to do with it. The fabric here is called Binka, and if you're old enough to remember needlework from school days, when it came under the umbrella of home economics rather than CDT, this is likely to have been the fabric you were given to practice your first embroidery stitches on. The squares are larger and the holes are more defined than those you find in Ada, the fabric more commonly used for cross stitch but more of Ada later. Along with the fabric, you'll find all the thread you will require to complete the picture, whichever type of kit you have purchased. You will also find this strange holy card onto which you can thread your stranded cotton, and this truly will make your cross stitch in life a whole lot easier. And with that job done, you're nearly ready to start and the next stage is to take a good look at the all-important chart. Even this very simple chart can be a little daunting to a complete novice, but it's actually incredibly easy to read when you know how. Each square represents a cross stitch and the key tells you what colour it should be. The single lines are back stitch and the key will again give you the colour. At first you might find it helpful to fill in the chart with appropriately coloured felt pens to keep you on the right track at a glance, because counting your stitches is something that does improve with practice but can be tricky at the outset. There's another important piece of information on the chart regarding how many strands of thread you need to use. Stranded cotton comes in six threads and for this kit you need all six for the cross stitch and three for the back stitch. As you progress to finer work, cross stitch is usually executed with two threads and back stitch one, so you can see that even for this beginner's kit, the ratio is constant. Having sorted the thread out, you now require your needle and of course with a good kit like this one, the right size and type is provided. This kit also has an extra needle included, just in case, and a piece of practice binker so you can try out your stitching technique before you begin the actual picture. And that really is all you need to get started and you'll be pleasantly surprised at how quickly you can finish this sort of kit. Incidentally, the price of a younger stitcher's kit is less than half an adult version, so it's a good economical way of discovering whether cross stitch is something you are going to enjoy doing. Once you're ready for your next project, it's time to return to the shop to select your first cross stitch proper kit. Many of the kits are actually graded on the packets and choosing an easy one is definitely a wise choice. In terms of cross stitch, this doesn't mean basic and unrewarding, it's simply that cross stitch can become very complex as experience is gained and advanced really does mean advanced. 
For the purposes of this programme, we will be sticking to cross stitch and back stitch, but many of the more advanced patterns use a wide range of additional stitches, and checking the stitching requirements will give you a good idea of the level of difficulty if a kit isn't graded. Also, the picture of the finished cross stitch can indicate if anything more taxing is required, but your best ally in this is usually the shop staff. If you come to a small specialist arts and crafts store like this one, you can be pretty sure that it's being staffed by enthusiasts and quite often run by the owner whose advice can be invaluable when you are getting started. That said, if you aren't lucky enough to have a retail outlet close by, you can, through the wonders of technology, source what you need via the internet. However, there's no substitute for a bona fide experienced needlecraft retailer. They are to be treasured, as many family-run fabric and haberdashery firms have simply disappeared from our high streets. Watch out for the excellent craft and specialist cross stitch magazines that are available because they are packed full of information and product reviews. They also publish cross stitch patterns with wonderfully straightforward instructions and can be an equally good starting point. Another growing trend is for huge art and craft fairs at venues like the NEC in Birmingham where you'll be able to buy everything you could possibly need for cross-stitching. Even as a beginner, clutching your chosen all-inclusive cross-stitch kit, there are a few extra items that will make creating your picture a great deal easier and a whole lot more enjoyable. This strange-looking contraption is not an instrument of torture, it's a standard embroidery frame and can be a godsend when it comes to keeping your cross stitch in place and easily handleable. You can get various sizes but they don't suit everyone, it's just a matter of personal taste. There is however one word of warning about embroidery frames. It can be very tempting to leave cross stitch on a frame until it's finished, but this can cause problems as it might be on the go for weeks or even months. Particularly if the base fabric is part of the design and cross stitch doesn't cover every inch of it, you will be left with deep creasing from the frame that will be difficult to get out. Each time you finish a cross stitch session, take your work off the frame. It only requires a couple of moments and will save you a lot of headaches later. Now, here's another peculiar looking object, but if you've reached the age 40 plus stage with your eyes, as you move objects you wish to see in close up at ever lengthening distances from your squinting face, then this might be the answer. It's a magnifying glass that goes around your neck and it works brilliantly. But for those of you lucky enough to have a youthful 2020 vision, don't dismiss this as when you progress to really fine work the extra magnification can be a great help. This might sound a tad obvious, but if you've never sewn before, a pincushion or needle case might not be part of your standard household equipment. 
However, for cross stitch, either or will be incredibly handy, especially as the needles really do need looking after. You might be surprised at this, but cross stitchers do actually wear needles out, and as the better quality ones are not cheap, it pays to look after them. Also, thimbles nowadays are more likely to be collected for decorative purposes, but this rather old-fashioned item can give great relief to sore fingers. A thimble won't suit everyone, but it might be worth a try if you have a tendency to stab yourself. A good pair of small embroidery scissors will be absolutely vital and an excellent tip here is to ban all other members of your household from using them so that they stay sharp. Cutting paper with these fine scissors will blunt them and there's nothing more frustrating than not being able to find your scissors when you need them. To this end, a box or bag to keep your cross stitch and associated paraphernalia in will be very useful and of course makes this most fascinating of needle crafts completely portable. There are other items that may be of use. Some people find needle threaders very helpful, but basically this short list will enable you to work to quite advanced levels. So if cross stitch is for you, then the investment is worthwhile. And on that happy note, you have everything before you, ready to start your next cross-stitch project. First and foremost, as you open your kit, don't panic. Even if it does look way more complicated than the bumblebee we stitched earlier. The principles are exactly the same when you get down to the nitty-gritty. So let's take a closer look. Any cross stitch pattern, whether it is as part of a kit or sold separately for you to provide your own materials, will have arrows marking the horizontal and vertical center lines. This piece of cross stitch is being worked by someone who likes to tack a guide along these lines to help her count, and this can be surprisingly useful. If you prefer not to, simply fold the fabric in half vertically and horizontally to find the center point and use a small stitch in a contrasting color to mark it. The chart will be divided into a grid that is made up of large squares, each one being 10 stitches by 10 stitches, indicated by the smaller squares. Counting is tricky, but here's another useful tip. Why not enlarge the chart so you can just glance at it to check yourself as you're stitching? This is something that will get easier with practice and of course you will also get speedier as well. Some charts, especially those in magazines and books, will already be marked in colour but as you see here, with so many different thread colours this time, it's impractical to use felt pens to mark it up. 
Each chart will have its own unique symbols which coincide with the pattern's recommended thread and relevant colour codes. With a kit, your thread is all provided, but if you wanted to use the pattern again, you would need to buy new fabric and floss. The chart will also tell you what stitches are required and how many strands to use as before, and you may find instructions for the odd fractional stitch. However, at this early stage, the fewer of those, the better, and after tackling all the full cross stitches, you'll be ready to handle the finer details. Moving on to the fabric, this time we have Ada with a 16 count. Ada is a fabric woven in a very accurate square pattern which makes it extremely easy to count stitches and for the needle to pass in and out with one cross stitch, generally speaking, covering one square. This is where the Ada count comes in, with our 16 count Ada indicating that you will need 16 cross stitches to cover one inch of fabric. The count of the fabric will determine the size of your finished work, with the smaller counts, like this six count Ada, requiring fewer stitches. As a beginner, the smaller the Ada count, the easier you will find the project, but as you progress, you will undoubtedly enjoy the challenge of finer fabrics. Many experienced cross-stitchers enjoy sewing on even weave fabric, which is any cotton, blended, linen or synthetic fabric that has been woven so that there are holes for stitching between the threads. But this is definitely something to look forward to, rather than worry about now. For anyone who imagines embroidery and needlecraft to be an outdated, old-fashioned art, one look at all the wonderful stranded cotton and threads available to stitch with will dispel the myth once and for all. You'll even find sparkling metallic threads and you can actually dye your own colours for really innovative effects, so literally the scope is as wide as your imagination. But today we have the threads all ready to use and depending on the kit you buy, they might even have been threaded onto an organiser in preparation for use. If not, no problem, you know what you need to do. Choosing the right needle for the type of work you are doing is important and fortunately it's provided in your kit, but for most cross stitch you will use a tapestry needle. Blunt ended with a large eye, tapestry needles come in various sizes and in the case of our 16 count aider in this kit, a size 26 tapestry needle will be required. The exception to this rule is when it comes to fractional stitches, when a sharper embroidery needle will split the strands of the fabric much more accurately. When it comes to threading your needle, snipping the ends of the strands required with scissors will give you more chance, and there is actually a wrong and right side to a needle, so if you're having trouble threading it, turn it around you might just have more luck. It all sounds a lot of preamble, but now you're ready to start stitching. 
If your piece of Ada is creased, you can gently iron it, and if you would prefer to work on a softer fabric, you can wash it first. Whether you're going to sew it in your hands or pop it over an embroidery frame, you do need to attend to the edges. Pinking shears will stop the fabric fraying, so will hemming or zigzag stitching the edge with a sewing machine. And as you see here, sellotape or masking tape also works very well indeed. In the main, cross stitchers don't tie knots in their thread when they start sewing. The simplest method being to draw the thread through the back of the fabric, leaving about an inch of floss that can then be secured by the next few stitches. Another option is to use a loop, but this will only work if you are using an even number of strands. Cut the cotton to twice the length you require and separate off just one strand. Take both ends of the cotton and thread through your needle. Put your needle into the fabric from the wrong side, exactly at the point where you want to start, leaving a loop on the underside. Then push the needle back into the fabric and pass it through the waiting loop, before starting stitching with a firmly held neat piece of cross stitching. Equally important, when you have come to the end of your stitches, on the back, run the needle through the reverse side of four or five crosses. If you run out of thread, try the two needle technique to keep your work tidy. Tuck the needle you are working with, still threaded, safely away from your design area. Thread up the second needle with the strands you want to continue with and sew the next few stitches. Then return to the first needle and push it through at the changeover point to the wrong side and finish off by running the thread through the new stitches. It really is important to keep the back of your cross stitch tidy because Ada is quite see-through and the last thing you want when you framed your work is to see the shadow of dangling threads showing through. This might all appear a little complicated and involved at first but you really will get the hang of it very quickly. Spend a few minutes just starting off and finishing on a practice piece of Ada. It's well worth the effort because the last thing you want is for your lovingly sewn cross stitches to unravel before your eyes. Let's pause and take a look at cross stitch being done and remind ourselves of the key points. Although the cross stitch is very simple, it can look absolutely beautiful or if insufficient care is taken, rather untidy. You can complete single stitches if you prefer, remembering to start in the bottom left hand corner of one block of the Ada and cross upwards to the top right and then down to the bottom right before completing with a cross to the top left. However, most people will do what's termed as working two journeys, which simply means doing a row of left bottom to top right stitches before coming back with a row of bottom right to top left to complete the cross stitches. When you've been stitching for a while, you might find that the thread twists and if you don't sort it out, your finished cross stitches will not lie flat. 
One answer is to turn your fabric upside down and let your needle spin until it corrects itself. Or alternatively, you can get into the habit of giving your needle a half turn each time you bring it out of the fabric. Keeping your cross stitches flat will help you produce more professional looking work, so establishing a good technique from the outset can make your efforts all the more rewarding. Now, as you progress, you will undoubtedly add more stitches to your repertoire, but even basic cross and back stitch can be livened up by varying the thread you use. Here's a brief look at what you might like to try. Today you can get stranded cotton in just about every colour you can possibly think of. It's often described as mercerised cotton, but don't let this confuse you. This description is of cotton yarn that has been treated with alkali to make it both stronger and more receptive to dye, so that it has a bright, lustrous sheen. The name comes from a 19th century textile maker called John Mercer, who invented the process. And looking at these lovely threads here, the technique is still working well to this day. The main manufacturers of stranded cottons are DMC, Anchor and Madeira, and magazine patterns will often give you the colour codes for all three, so you can choose whichever suits you best. As well as plain colours, you can also get variegated threads, which are wonderful when it comes to adding light and shade. Creating the impression of water is certainly helped by variegated thread, but you do need to complete both parts of the cross stitch at the same time. You'll get a very strange effect if you try working two journeys with variegated thread. When you've had a chance to get accustomed to cross stitching, you might like to consider using metallic threads to enhance your designs. They are a little trickier to handle, but there are plenty of tips to help you out. Firstly, make sure you use a tapestry needle that's large enough to open the fabric up sufficiently for the thread to pass through without being rubbed. If you don't, it will quickly look frayed and untidy. Also, use short lengths of metallic thread, nothing beyond about 18 inches, to avoid further abrasion. Metallic thread will twist more than conventional floss, so remember to let the needle drop even more frequently, just as shown earlier. This decorative thread will be single-stranded, but you can blend it with strands of other threads to alter the thickness of each stitch and vary the amount of sparkle you get. One word of warning though, don't keep metallic threads with your other cottons. Store them in polythene bags or plastic containers to protect them from wear and tear. Here's a surprising tip that might have the rest of your family wondering about your sanity, but it does work. Try keeping your metallic threads in the fridge. It makes them much easier to work with. And if you still need further inspiration, don't forget that you can sew charms, buttons, sequins and beads into your cross stitch for added texture and a glittering finish. 
It's amazing how quickly you can get completely hooked on cross stitching and you may well find that the cross stitch kits are somewhat limiting for a vivid imagination. It's actually very easy to design your own cross stitch motifs and all you need to start is some squared paper and coloured pens or pencils that can approximately be matched to stranded cottons. Simple motifs are best and all you do is map your design out on your squared paper. You can then try it out on different aid accounts or even weave fabrics with varying numbers of strands until you get the effect that you want. These little cross stitch pieces are ideal for making cards and you can buy ready cut cards with envelopes from good art and craft shops. In fact you'll usually find them wherever you buy your cross stitch supplies. These are especially good because they have a fold over flap to keep your sewing very neatly in place and double sided tape is the perfect answer for all your fixing requirements. As you get more experienced you may like to take on a project like this that truly has become a much loved family heirloom. By basing her design on her own family, this cross-stitcher has told a wonderful story about her nearest and dearest. Some of the designs she has worked out for herself, while others she has taken from pattern books like this one you see here. Even if you want to create something completely original, it's well worth flicking through a book of this type as it will help you understand how to make an image out of cross stitch. And don't forget, if you're happy using computer technology, there are many software packages available that will convert your designs and even family photographs into cross stitch patterns. Here's another wonderful way to use cross stitch to create a gift that's sure to be treasured. This beautiful picture was sewn to commemorate a 25th wedding anniversary. There are kits available to help you make cross stitch pictures for special occasions and literally all you need to do is select the initials and the dates to personalise the project. However, there is one very important word of caution on this count. Give yourself plenty of time to complete your picture because cross stitch will usually take longer than you anticipate to finish and you don't want to go to all the effort of stitching it and not be able to give it to the recipient on their special day. If you're looking at these lovely pieces and wondering how on earth you would keep the fabric clean as you are stitching, there are some things you can do to ensure a spotless finish. Now obviously everyone gives their hands a good wash before beginning, but with very fine fabrics the slightest speck of grease will mark it. Fine gloves can be a help, just cut off the fingertips and you'll have all the precise movement you need. However, don't despair, you can always wash your finished embroidery carefully by hand with bleach-free soap. Rinse well but gently and squeeze out as much excess water as you can with a soft clean towel and allow it to dry naturally. If you want to then iron your work, cover your ironing board with up to four layers of light coloured towels. Place your embroidery face down on the towel and carefully press the work from the wrong side using the steam button to help you. It's not a good idea to iron metallic threads, but if you have to, cover with a cloth and only use a low heat again on the wrong side. Also be careful if you've sewn beads or buttons into your design. Ah.
After paying so much attention to detail while working the cross stitch, it's really important to present your finished embroidery with equal care. Good straight mounts, centred work and clean lined frames will enhance any piece of cross stitch, while off-centre, not squared, poorly fitting frames will spoil the most otherwise perfect piece of sewing. Even with a greetings card, you can really enhance your work. Place the card aperture over the piece of work and use pins to mark the edges so that you can trim your sewing to make sure it fits the card. Then use double-sided tape to stick the fabric precisely where you want it. You can also use a layer of thin quilter's warning to give the finished result a more sumptuous effect. There are many different types of cards that you can buy to put your cross stitch in and as you see here, even the simplest of design will make a lovely card. Also think about the fabric you use. This card has been made using Ada that has a gold thread running through it, which is very decorative. These cards have all had lettering added to them using gold stickers. Sheets of letters are readily available and add a far more professional touch than ordinary handwriting would. Cross stitch cards for children can be great fun. This little penguin is delightful and a plain white card sets him off a treat. The little drummer boy has been put into a fancier card but look closely and you'll see just how detailed the stitching is. It can seem an awful lot of effort to go to for a card but do remember by cutting off the back of the card that's been written on these cross stitches are perfectly mounted and all ready to put into photo frames as keepsakes. Framing any type of needlework needs to be done with care and again adding a layer of padding will make the details stand out beautifully. If you can manage not to use glass, then the texture will be more easily appreciated. But if you do, try to ensure that it doesn't touch the actual embroidery. Here's another really good tip. Fabric pictures are much loved by small insects, but the addition of a layer of aluminium foil between the picture and the final backing board of the frame will certainly discourage them. The more skilled you get with your stitching, the more intricate your pictures will become. This beautiful teddy bear picture would be perfect for a child's bedroom and certainly looks very professional indeed. But just to prove the point, here's the chart as worked by the cross stitcher in question and if you're wondering what the pink marks are, she offered a very useful tip. Sometimes, when you're getting started on a new piece, it's good to mark your pattern with a highlighter pen as you complete each cross stitch. This makes counting much easier and you're less likely to miss your place and have to start unpicking. Talking to other cross stitchers is a marvellous way of learning and there are many very good groups of embroiderers and cross stitchers that you can join all over the country. Here's another prime example of how helpful it can be to talk to an experienced cross stitcher. This picture is incredibly intricate, but the biggest problem, according to the lady responsible for sewing it, was actually the garden sections in the background. With no specific details, it's very hard to count your stitches, but again, an answer was found. By tacking in the large squares of the grid, she was able to work one square at a time, making life much easier. 
It has to be said, cross-stitchers are pretty resourceful folk and shared experience can save an awful lot of time. If all of these pictures look a little advanced, you can always start on a much smaller scale. There are lovely kits that come complete with the correct size frame and if you centre your stitching properly, the result is equally as satisfying. Earlier in this programme, you've seen what cross-stitchers term as a bell pull and although these highly decorative items are not as large as a picture, they still look very effective indeed when completed. You'll need to buy rods before you start to get the size right, but you can create your own designs or use a pattern book. The 12 days of Christmas is charming and the fine animals on this even weave fabric are exceptional. But here's another idea. This cross stitcher has used a design with a seasonal flower for each month of the year and these bell pulls would make the perfect gift for a keen gardener. The only thing you do need to remember is the fact that you will require some kind of backing fabric and of course a tassel made of stranded cotton as used in the stitching will be the perfect finishing touch. These tassels are very easy to make and you can also use tapestry wool or metallic threads if you want to create a different texture. When you've selected your thread, decide what length you require your tassel to be and cut a piece of stiff card to the appropriate size. Wrap your thread evenly around the card and keep going until you have the thickness you want. Then, with a threaded needle, draw the tassel together and tie firmly, at which point you can snip across the bottom of the threads and remove the tassel from the card. With a further length of thread, tightly wrap around the neck of the tassel and knot. The remaining thread will just mix into the tassel and if it's a little uneven, you can trim it up. Simply attach it wherever you like with matching thread stitched through the top loop. It couldn't be easier and you'd never find one ready-made the exact colour that you wanted and of course, even better, your own version will be at a fraction of the cost. All of the examples of cross-stitch we've been looking at have been quite fine and more decorative than functional, but for many cross-stitchers, making cushions gives them the opportunity to fulfil both criteria. Geometric patterns can work extremely well and cross-stitch with its square-by-square -square formula is an ideal way of stitching this type of design. You can also see how you can use thicker walls rather than fine silks. However, if you prefer to stitch a picture, a design like this will work equally well. Covering the whole image with cross stitch is more practical than leaving parts of the base fabric exposed as in the pictures because it will stay cleaner, or at least not show the dirt quite so obviously. Before you start though, do pick your contrasting fabric for the back of your cushion and a standard readily available cushion pad will complete your project. You can, of course, cross-stitch both sides of the cushion if you want to, but you can only ever see one side at a time and you'll have two lots of cross-stitch for your trouble if you use a plain back. 
do make sure that all the fabrics and threads are at least hand washable because cross stitch cushions are extremely tactile objects and after so much effort you do want to be able to keep them looking nice. Sadly, our time looking at cross stitch has just about run out. Hopefully this introduction will have shown you just what a fascinating art form this really is that always has and always will be far more than a slanting stitch one way and then the other. However, if this is all the sewing you happen to be capable of then you are at a very good starting point. What you do with your crosses is literally as wide and varied as your imagination and the materials you can lay your hands on. All that now remains is to wish you many happy hours of sewing as you can rest assured that once you've started cross stitching you'll never be, pardon the pun, at a loose end ever again. Mm -hmm.